Let me introduce to you Steph Vermeulen, a longtime personal friend, close friend, and sometimes my pseudo shrink. Um, Steph is a leading voice um, on emotional intelligence. She's known as the EQ lady, and um, I am very fortunate that we have her with us this afternoon. She's a multi-published author. Um, you will find her books in stores, and I am sure on Amazon. And I am going to unleash my good friend, Steph Vermeulen, on you. <laughs> Take it away, Steph. <laughs> Thank you, Steph, for all your kindness and generosity. <laughs> But we're talking about managing lockdown and staying in business. And obviously, uh, for all of us, our businesses have changed dramatically since the, the, the COVID virus. So just to get straight into this, we're going to be looking today during my presentation, we're specifically going to be looking today at how our nervous system actually responds and then creates the behaviors that we think are part of our personality, but are in fact only our nervous system responding because of the way it's been programmed throughout our lives. So we're looking at obviously an advancement on emotional intelligence, which is, this is the, the copy of my first book. And most people think emotional intelligence is something that's new. It's been around since 1995. This first book of mine was published in 1999, and that was long before any of the equipment like MRI, etc., became sophisticated enough for us to have a peek into the brain and see what's actually happening. So once all of that in this millennium, once we had the technology to really start seeing what was happening in the brain, then we now combine EQ with neuroscience, which is the subject of my latest book called Personal Intelligence. This book for any Anyone who's interested is available on Amazon, um, on Kindle as well, so you don't even have to wait for delivery. But something that really fascinates me is the polyvagal theory of Stephen Porges, who is a pure scientist and was looking at what is it that is important to us as human beings. And the only thing that is important to us as human beings is in fact safety. And it's, it's safety in every way that we could imagine. But obviously it starts with our physical safety because the genes or our DNA drives us to our, our main driver in terms of the DNA is to be able to drive us to grow up and be old enough to procreate. And once we've done that, or if we've chosen not to do that now, because thank goodness for contraception, it was something that I didn't choose to, to have my own children. And so in the days before contraception, that once you'd either procreated or were too old to procreate, then for all of us who are aging speakers, that all that's happening is our genes, start, our genes run out of oomph and they start to deteriorate. So they don't really care much about us. And then we start the long pro. A long, a long genetic process of, of starting to die. And in our, those of us that are in, in our 60s, that uh, obviously that starts with the decay. And, but safety is still the most important thing in every aspect. So our entire nervous system is really programmed with safety in mind, safety in every single aspect. But for us, most importantly, is psychological safety. And this psychological safety is all about, as we saw on the previous slide, love, safety, and trust. And trust is absolutely key to our nervous system in terms of relationships. And when we're looking at psychological safety, once we feel safe, it is then easy for us to thrive as human beings. Until such time as we feel safe, the nervous system is so busy looking at what is a threat, how can we be threatened, um, or what is threatening us. <clears throat> Sorry, that was just a phone ringing, <laughs> an interruption. So our brain can't function because our nervous system is taking up all of the energy. Now, when it comes to our nervous system, the main nerve running through our bodies is called the vagus nerve. And vagus comes from the term vagrant, as in the wanderer, because it is the nerve that controls absolutely everything in our system. The vagus nerve has two parts. So it has an upper part and a, a lower part. The one is much more mature in terms of evolution than the other. 
But the interesting thing about our vagus nerve is my vagus nerve only feels safe and alive when it meets your vagus nerve. So our social engagement system means that we are entirely dependent to even to know who we are uh, by, through the reflection of other people. And other people are dis or enormously important to us as human beings because we simply cannot even survive on our own. So the vagus, the vagus nerve was the central study of the scientist, Dr. Stephen Porges, and he came up with this theory some time ago, which he's been researching and studying since, called polyvagal theory. And that is how all of our behavior rests upon the platform of our nervous system in terms of how we respond to other people and how we respond to other people has nothing to do with our personality. Our personality is in fact just the mask that we wear when meeting other people. So sometimes we have a mask that we wear that is, is our work mask. Our work mask might be different from our social mask. But the interesting thing about the word mask is, or the word person is it comes from the Latin word for for mask. So our personality is about the different masks we wear, depending on who we are dealing with. And that's why uh, solitary confinement is absolute agony for human beings. And when people have been in solitary confinement and they've had nobody to reflect back to them, then they simply start talking to the cockroaches and the mice and ants and anybody that they can f have, have a relationship with, as it were, because it is so desperate lonely in terms of our nervous system not having anybody to reflect back who we are. Now this also operates with our emotions and our emotions are well known to run the traffic between our thinking brain and our, our body and they do so in terms of hormones. We know about the stress hormone for example cortisol and the stress hormone will flood our system when we actually uh, when we're in stressful situations, which I'm going to show you what we mean by that. And it obviously then has reactions which focus on safety and literally turn off our thinking brain simply because there's no blood flow that's going to our thinking brain. So that's why when we're highly stressed, it's difficult to remember people's names, it's difficult to remember short term, and because the stress is literally making us just focus on, on safety. Now, what for me was fascinating about our vagus nerve is that it connects to our face, it connects our heart to our faces via the ear. And that's a very relevant factor in terms of how we relate to one another as human beings. Because what we call body language or our facial expressions are literally wearing our heart on our faces. And that heart, the heart through our vagus nerve and the, the expressions that we pull when we are, are looking at other people tells a huge story in terms of what's going on with my vagus nerve as I'm relating to you. But the interesting part of that is the most validating for us as human beings is when we know we're being listened to. And even Steph was mentioning in the beginning that it's difficult for us as speakers when we don't have any expressions coming from your vagus nerves to give us some feedback about whether this is interesting for you or whether it's not because obviously it'll be more interesting to some than others. But listening to other people is the most important thing we can do to validate the other person's existence. And we see that, that the vagus nerve literally goes through the ear in terms of our facial expressions. So when somebody's not listening, we know that we can see that through in their face. We have an expression that we use called, their eyes simply glaze over. But something that is, is equally interesting is there is the saying that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas because our life experience is literally imprinted upon our nervous system and this causes us to respond. Now we all know about perception. Perception is what we see, what we hear and, and what our thinking brain is busy with. 
And we know also how inadequate perception is. I'm sure many of you have seen that test with the gorilla and 50% of people simply don't see what's happening on the screen. So our perception is very limited, but what Stephen Porges called our neuroception is literally our nervous system is looking or scanning or the radar of our nervous system is scanning the environment all the time in terms of how safe am I right now? Am I psychologically safe? Am I emotionally safe? Am I physically safe? Now, ordinarily, we would call this our gut feeling. So intuition now has a physical basis. And it may be that it's coming from our past or that we're experiencing something like the post-traumatic stress syndrome that is triggering our system. It will trigger it in the same way as when we experienced the trauma or alternatively, there's something that we're not noticing. And lots of people say, I don't know where that person came from, but I just had a bad feeling about something that had a violent attack, for example. But it's for this reason that true scientists, not woo-woo people, but true scientists are talking about that our body is actually our subconscious mind. Every experience we've ever had is registered in our nervous system and we will respond accordingly. Now, how this works, it works a little bit like a ladder and we go up and down this ladder all day, every day, depending on who we're dealing with. When we feel safe, we're at the top of the ladder, it's belonging, we feel inclined to be social, how uh, we feel like seeking out other people, and it's that real sense of belonging that makes us feel psychologically safe. Now, when we're in a situation like of isolation, of lockdown, we don't know what's going to happen, we don't know the spread of the disease, we don't know any of these things, we're completely operating in the unknown. Probably the only people who are going to feel comfortable in this green zone where they feel safe and they feel calm in this green zone are introverts like me who are in a safe environment, who have a comfortable relationship with our partner, with, with, um, in, in a partnership. So there's a, and we have enough food to eat and there's nothing threatening us. For people who are extroverts, this lockdown must be utter hell because they need other people's feedback all the time. So when we feel safe and calm, that's when we can be productive. So in all likelihood, the very small percentage of people who are enjoying this isolation are those who are likely also to be the most productive because they feel safe and they feel calm and they can then be creative. This is our moment when we can be really creative. Now, when we think about the management role, the management role, if we don't keep people safe and make them feel calm and make them feel like they belong and, and, and that they are valued or heard or listened to, what are we doing to them? We are likely to mobilize their fight or flight and the, the nature of the vagus nerve. And as we move into danger or where we experience danger or where we're not feeling particularly safe, this will trigger the fight or flight and the new one because obviously of our social nature rather than the danger from our environment is to appease. Now, often women learn that when we need to appease um, because that's about being nice. We're not supposed to be angry. And if we are angry, we're supposed to go away and, and, and self-regulate and, and come back and be nice once more. So quite often, women who are involved in dangerous relationships will spend most of their energy appeasing. Now, this is no different from anybody who is in management who feels threatened by their manager. You can't run away from your job necessarily, although many people would like to <laughs> quite often. And you can't necessarily fight back either because if you're dealing with a bully, it's very difficult. And you're dealing with a bully hierarchical management. You may not have even, act, you may not have access to that person. But when that happens, if we can do neither of those things, and we feel in danger, <clears throat> that's when we get into the collapsed zone. This is the freeze where we feel entirely, excuse me, <clears throat> where we feel threatened and we just completely freeze. We don't respond at all. 
This could often look like stonewalling or walking out of a fight. But in fact, it's because I'm completely immobilized. One of the fascinating things at this point is that our ear, remember that your vagus nerve connects your heart to your face via your ear. And at this point, we become so immobilized that we can't even hear somebody. So we may see the mouth moving and we may see the mouth moving and somebody spitting at us in anger, but we literally cannot hear what they are saying. And so if we, we can't, if we can't run away and we can't fight, we literally go into this awful collapse state. Now, if we look at the green zone, I feel connected, I belong, I'm comfortable. If we can get ourselves back there, then we can start being creative, innovative. What can we make meaning from in terms of this lockdown? How can we make lives, other people's lives, more meaningful? How can we assist? Do we need a new economic system, for example? Because this is really showing up the inequalities. We can do that. That sort of thinking when we are in this green zone. In the next zone, when I'm scared, then I'm going to fight. I'm going to try and do something possibly with the anxiety I'm feeling. Often you'll hear people say, you know, my manager obviously is an insom insomniac. So he or she will wake up at three in the morning and they, they start sending out emails. That's just your manager's way of trying to manage their own anxiety. They can't sleep, it's anxious enough, so they're trying to do something around that to manage their own anxieties it's not personal it's just how they have they, they have adapted to what they are feeling so our danger zone is anger and fear anger makes us fight and fear makes us that will take us to that state of collapse or obedience so literally the bottom phrase is the phase is i just can't cope with this i'm overwhelmed and i can't cope but if we have a look at what happens in business or with other people, that this is an inward focus, the, the amber zone, like a traffic light, and the red zone. This is inward. This is about me, and, and my only focus is about me. My only priority is about me. But when we <coughs> are in the green zone, you can see that's where we collaborate. I feel safe enough to listen to you, to validate you through, through my listening. And I can, and the, the, the fight, flight and free zone is simply I'm in a fight for my life and this is where our competitiveness comes out. Now it's not all bad because when we are, are in that competitive zone, that's the self-protection and the top zone, the green zone is true connection. So when we are in these three stages, we'll be up and down this ladder all day long, but they're not all bad in the orange and the, the red zone. The orange, the orange zone sometimes mobilizes us to get productive. If we're, oh, I might lose my job, etc. So we start giving of our best. And in the collapsed zone, the threat zone at the bottom, when we're truly exhausted, that's when we need time for self-reflection. And that collapsed zone will force us into time, into a time when we simply are needing self-reflection and needing to recharge our batteries. So this is all neck down. You may be asking, well, what is our brain or our thinking mind doing? Because this is literally from brain stem, which is our neck downwards. And we just react going up and down this ladder all day long. What's really important for us to know is where do we live? Do we live in the depressed zone at the bottom where we just feel immobilized all the time, valueless, ashamed, I'm not good enough. If that's where we live, it's going to be hard to get motivated. In the danger zone, we're so busy fighting with everybody to possibly deal with some of that anxiety because it feels a lot better being busy than it does being immobilized. How do we get ourselves into the safe zone? That's inspiration that gets us there. You've heard Steph Duplessis talk often enough about that Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, which is a bit of a sexist title, but that him and I will fight about. And so when we, when we discussed, we're talking about Man's Search for Meaning, we're talking about being in the green zone. When we start helping other people, when we start making a difference, automatically it takes us into that safe zone 
where we can easily or we are we're wanting to collaborate with other people but what does the thinking mind do if the nervous system does psychology our psychology our personality our habits our emotions our physical responses in every way everything that we think of as personality is literally how our nervous system has adapted or our adapt how our behavior is adaptive given our nervous system's programming so what does the thinking mind do what does the brain do well the brain sits over here kind of making up stories about what's going on so the brain is trying to explain what is going on like you're seeing lots of if you're on social media at all you're seeing lots of conspiracy theories at the moment and there seems to be a huge resurgence of conspiracy theories telling you that that the that Bill Gates is producing vaccines, et cetera, that are going to harm everybody and the Illuminati and all of that stuff is just the brain making up stories. Now that's when the brain can actually get quite dangerous. The other side of that is when we start getting creative and innovative. So it also starts telling us our defense mechanisms, which is why you see here the Pinocchio's nose, because our brain is lying to us all the time. And in terms of even the positive thinking stuff can be part of this, us trying to convince ourselves that things are okay, simply puts us in denial. So all we need to do is feel those feelings and allow ourselves to feel bad, to notice it, to go, okay, I'm not feeling safe right now. What can I do to get myself back into the safe zone? And the one thing that we can control is our breathing. So if you start feeling anxious, a simple thing to do is literally to just switch off your thinking mind by listening to the sounds around you. As long as it's not kids screaming or colleagues whining or anybody else whining for that matter. And you just start to focus on your breathing. And the breathing are the most effective thing we can do to calm ourselves down is to take long out breaths. And even if you're not concerned about that, other people might think you've gone stark raving mad, is to even make a noise while you're doing it. Some of the, 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 the scientists go, if you make a noise, ooh, as you're breathing out. Now I know that sounds very woo woo and sounds completely nuts, but it forces you to take a long out breath. And that will start to, within a minute, will start to calm your nervous system down. So this is the competition and this is the protection side. And this is what our thinking brain does. When we're in collaboration, it's thinking about adding to. When we're thinking in terms of the competitive side or the side that is, is trying to have one up on each other, and that's usually what competition does. And competition and collaboration cannot exist in, 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 the, same, in the same forum. It's one or the other. So we're up and down like a game of snakes and ladders all day long. We go up the ladders and we might go up to number, number 25 and carry on and get to 46 and land on 45. Oh, and we're down a snake again. So this is what happens all day long. And it's just simply how our nervous system is responding. So when we feel safe, we're in that power position of yes, other than that, and, and we keep trying to move into that position. But other, if we're not there, then the ladders can take us straight down and within a second, our insecurities can be triggered that take us into threat or, or, or that collapse state. And this too affects our motivation. Remember the, the danger and the threat zones is usually where we're trying to move away from the discomfort all the time. And moving away is a, a motivation of sorts, but it's not as powerful as moving towards. So if we know what gives our lives meaning, which is what my entire training process, all the self-evaluation is designed to at the end culminates in you knowing what gives your life its deepest meaning. When we know that and we can start working towards that, we can get into that truly powerful motivation. But remember, all of this is underpinned by trust. If we break someone's trust, and it's whether they're a client, whether they're a colleague, the, that person will un, it's unlikely to ever trust us again, which means we can't get all of them involved in the cooperation or the connection that we need to collaborate. 
So one of the big things that we don't do, certainly in terms of management, we spend a lot of time telling people. We spend a lot of time telling them, maybe even in performance managers, management sessions, but how often do we actually listen to people? Remember, there's nothing more validating than listening to people. So if we look at what our nervous system needs, and there's a lot of information on the screen, which you don't need to worry about for now, because it also includes number 14. And the most important is to listen. But all of these form the chapters of Mungi Ngomani's book called Everyday Ubuntu. So if we look at what our nervous system needs and what Ubuntu offers us, there's such validity. And if we don't come from the, the, the value system of Ubuntu for us to learn the meaning of it, because there's nothing more powerful than being able to collaborate and support one another. That's what makes our nervous system feel truly safe. So if we look at what Maya Angelou said, and it's very profound in terms of our nervous system because it's extremely true. We always remember or have how people made us feel. If you listen to people, they will feel validated, which doesn't really say much for us speakers, does it? But thank you for your ears. And if you want to be in contact, either contact me via uh, steps website essays based speakers or you can find out more uh, from the book there's a whole emotional dictionary in the back of the book so that you can learn to decode the meaning of your feelings and that too will help to calm the nervous system down so our brain doesn't have to be thinking about safety it can be thinking about being creative thank you step now you all know why she is my pseudo shrink <laughs> um, Steph, thank you um, thank you thank you thank you i see lots of people um giving you a virtual applause there um thank if you. you if you want to know more of what steph does reach out to her direct google her name um you'll find her or reach out to us at essays best you'll find we'll help you here's what we can do for you if you're in a leadership role and you are struggling to keep your people focused, motivated, inspired, I don't want to say motivated, inspired, on board and on track at this time, reach out. We can run virtual town halls for you. We can work with you um, any way necessary. All of us have, have shifted what we do to be able to work virtually, not only in terms of talking head to camera, but we are facilitating sessions, um, running interactive sessions, engaging with our clients um, and all of us are learning rapidly and are able to help you going forward. Steph, is there anything you want to add to what you were speaking about before in terms of maybe a snippet of practical coping skill, um, something in addition to what you shared with us earlier that um, folk can, can, can use during this time of lockdown just to, just to get through the other side in the best shape they can emotionally? Yes. I think one of the things when you were talking about the motivational stuff and the, uh, that post on, on social media, I also saw that it's unhelpful to put yourself under too much pressure at the moment because we're all grappling with difficulties and difficult emotions and compassion for others. And when we go shopping, we see people who are desperate and what can we do? And so we're not going to be at our best at the moment. It, it would be impossible to do so. If everybody was on holiday and we were on paid holidays, then yes, we can all write a book and we can all do the things that we've always wanted to do, but not everybody feels that way. So when it comes to feelings, the one thing that positive thinking does is override our our feelings. So when our feelings get to feel like they are too much, instead of overriding them and trying to convince ourselves that it's not so, uh, because feelings won't be appeased, they won't go away on their own, is just to acknowledge what we're feeling and go, okay, I feel really uncomfortable right now. And to watch that feeling almost as if you were watching waves in the sea. So when you just observe the feeling and notice that it's quite strong now, then it goes away then the feeling feels expressed and it will go away. And so much in the same way as emotions, I often relate to them as being warning lights in a motor car. If our warning light comes on, we usually stop and do something about it and or 
unless you're female, you just carry on driving and, and hope that it will, all will be fine. But so we would stop, do something about it. And in the same way, we can work with our feelings. Just notice them. If you have a copy of my book, any of my books will provide you with an emotional dictionary. And that's helpful in terms of, okay, anger means I'm being compromised. Yes, I am feeling compromised right now. And it's okay. Because one thing we do is we reject bad emotions. We say those make us feel bad. So we're not feeling that. And we natter or the thinking mind goes into overdrive trying to tell ourselves it's all okay whereas in fact we can actually just acknowledge that emotion because we have a right to all of our emotions and all emotions are useful because and all emotions are okay so our habits are what gets us stuck in that collapsed phase of depression anxiety our habit is sometimes to mobilize to fight because it makes us feel better but those are just habits they're not our persona and they certainly are not genetic as one of the questions came through there's very little in terms of behavior that is genetic very 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 little all of it is about our habits and the habits of our nervous system. So just to acknowledge our emotions and go, it's okay to feel cuck right now because that's where we're at. And it's okay. If we don't do that, then our feelings will just get louder and noisier like the rattles in our car. If we, if we own the car ourselves, the rattles get noisier. If it's a higher car, you just drive faster, as we know, <laughs> with the rattles. So it's important to just acknowledge that all of our feelings are okay. And if we're feeling bad, it's okay. It would be normal under the circum in the circumstances. Say thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to try and apply all the stuff you've always taught me. And I'm going to phone you for a personal counseling session <laughs> You're welcome. later today, as you, <laughs> as you, you sometimes you, do for me. You do so much for all of us speakers that I think it's our time to support you. So I know you're joking, but you're absolutely welcome. Steph, there's a question for you. How do you deal with a schmuck of a manager during these times? Um, <laughs> tell us, please. I think that one of the things that these times do that makes it a lot easier is the distance and the remoteness. So one has to remember that that manager, whatever the behavior is, is managing their own demons, literally. So if we can dissociate from taking things personally, which is always the problem, if we think that the manager is behaving like a bully or whatever it might be because it's to do with me, then our own, us taking it personally becomes the problem. It has nothing to do with us. It's how they are managing their own nervous system. So it allows us a bit of detachment, which is always healthy. But if it's a bully, we need to stand up to a bully. If you shout and scream at a bully, then the bully will just simply shout and scream louder. They're much more practiced at this than you are. So it just all depends on how we stand up to them. And many people have, are familiar with the notion of transaction analysis, where you've got different states, parent, adult, child. The parent is the one who often is the bully. You will not do this. And, and it all is delivered in tone. The child does the victim thing when being bullied and goes, oh, are you picking on me again? And, and so sounding like the child. But if the adult says, you are trying to bully me now, because you want me to do X and you know I'm busy with Y or whatever it might be in this neutral tone, one can literally get away with murder. So it's about naming the game. And it's always when you are being manipulated, it's about saying, I know that you're manipulating me now because you, or we all become the second player in somebody's manipulation through our own silence. So when we don't say anything, we think that silence means you just read my, read my lips or look at the look on my face, you'll get it. But the other person doesn't. When we don't stand up to the bully, we give them permission to carry on bullying us. When we do, they may get worse before they get better. They may scream louder, but that's okay. But they'll go, often will go and bully somebody else who's much more likely to play victim to their bully. So if we play victim, we are stuffed and it's the victim that is, it goes quiet. The interesting thing about the being the victim and being at the bottom of the rung of that ladder that we talked about in that red zone, when we're feeling down, when we're feeling depressed, when we're feeling overwhelmed, our brain literally squirts chemicals, the chemical, the cuddle chemical oxytocin to make us want to connect to other people. 
which is really interesting. So what do we do when we're being bullied by somebody we'll, in, these un, uh, in these lockdown times, we may call a friend because what do we do? We then Skinner about that person. So we're trying to find somebody else who will share our view and to connect with them rather than solve the problem. So it's much easier to stand up to the bully, but using that neutral adult tone, rather than if we were in the office, we'd go, if you were a smoker, you'd go and find another smoker and go outside for a smoke so that you can go and skinner about this person and then regulate. It's all about regulating our emotions, which is why when we're at our worst state, we actually want to connect with other people. And it's our brain chemistry that makes us do that or want to do that. So it's about standing up to and naming the game. Thank you, Steph. Hello, kitty cat on Steph's left. There's kitty cat, indeed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Cool, okay. So I think one of the most important closing thoughts particularly for today is, or just two things. Firstly, it would be your nervous system that is responding to your life being threatened when every time you jump, your life literally was being threatened. So your nervous system would automatically tell you that this, the fear is the appropriate response. And so it would be really surprising for anybody who's not afraid of such a circumstance, but it's how we manage that, which I think is what you're all talking about. So the most important thing in terms of this time is to manage our fear because fears will come and go. And in terms of, are we safe? Are we not safe? What, the, what is the future? None of us know. And that is something that may, will make everybody afraid at times. So we go, okay, I'm afraid it's okay. To be able to feel good and get into that green zone is not a matter of talking ourselves into the feel good at all. It just, that doesn't work. If anything, it's just a temporary reprieve or the denial sets in. <clears throat> what we can do is go out and make a difference. Our country is crying out for people to make a difference and it doesn't have to be anything big. It just means when you go shopping, perhaps add a whole lot of tins that are self-opening and when you see beggars on the side of the road, give them money, give them a tin and also you can, you can get the, the telephone number of certainly the Gauteng government is providing food parcels. So if anybody wants, I have that number, I have it on a sheet you can cut out and you can literally like little business cards, give it to people and tell them that they can apply for a food parcel. Now this isn't going to save the world, but at least if we can do something that is meaningful in this time to make a difference to the millions of people out there that are in need presently. And, and then we can also start to think about new ways of doing things. This equality is showing itself in the most vulgar form right now. And us feeling guilty about our privilege isn't going to help anybody. We can be grateful for our privilege, but not take it for, a gra for granted. And look at what can I do to go and ease somebody's suffering, whatever that might be during these difficult times. If we just do something small every day to make a difference, it will make a big difference to that person if we can feed a family for a day, but it will also make us feel better in terms of managing our own stuff. And that's really what the whole notion of Ubuntu is about. I can only exist as a reflection of you. When we exist in our privilege as a reflection of all the poor people who survive in this country, then it's not a good feeling at all. We need to do something and we need to change a very broken system that has created this. That's the big stuff. Do what we can. We can think the big stuff and do what we can just for today. Steph, um, I'm not blowing smoke. Um, you've just said two things that will help me immensely. Um, I don't know why you haven't told me this 20 years ago, but we'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> I suffer severe guilt for my privilege and I cannot cope that I can't fix everything that's broken but yeah. that's good advice so we need to we can go out and we can do yeah.